Greetings. I thought I'd do a video in parallel with one of my teardowns, explain why I have a tendency to do the schematics, why I do them the way I do, how I do the schematics, and why I'd encourage anyone wanting to learn more about how something works to do the same. I'll be using one of these Riello UPS boards as my example. First of all, why do them? Well, it looks good, doesn't it? I think so. Even if you don't want to watch the whole video, and to be honest, I don't blame you, you can jump to the schematic and check it out, or look in the video description for a link to a copy of it. Why the way I do it? Well, I find it easier. There's absolutely nothing wrong with hand drawing schematics, as Forrest M. Mims III proved years ago. BigClive.com does them, and plenty of them, and who can say no to a bit of DaveCAD? Incidentally, I found that video in trying to find an example image of DaveCAD, and just my luck, it's Dave Jones demonstrating how to reverse engineer a board to get to a schematic, which is what I'm trying to do now. I've not watched it, Dave will have his way, I've got my way, they may be the same. You'd have to watch and find out. Hand-drawn schematics are a bit unforgiving when it comes to making mistakes though, and that doesn't suit me because I will make mistakes, and plenty of them as you'll see shortly. Some glaring ones may even find their way into the videos, so I prefer something that'll let me fix or tweak the schematic before exporting it as an image so that I can bring it into video and hopefully get it right before I publish it. That something is Eagle. Eagle 7.7 to be precise, the last of the ones before Autodesk took it over and made it subscription based. I like Eagle because it's powerful, and for personal, non-commercial use or educational use, it's free. Free is good. Eagle lets me tweak the layout of the schematic as it's built, moving components or even entire chunks of the schematic to make way for new circuitry, or to make the layout easier to understand. Once I've got it the way I like it, and everything at least seems to be correct, more on that later, I can export it as an image file that just needs its size tweaking before bringing it into Vegas with the rest of the video. As I discovered recently, I can also just print out to a PDF file, which will give a fully scalable drawing in a very compact file, either in colour or all black, suitable for printing or zooming right into. Ok, that's the why, the why and the what with, how about how? How do I go from this board to this schematic? Now you may just think I'm using existing schematics from the internet or from user manuals and just redrawing them, and you'd be wrong. Unless stated otherwise, all of my schematics are reverse engineered from the circuit board being examined. Even the huge ones, and the biggest one I've done so far was the LaserMax controller board on my Revelations quiz machine. It all starts with the circuit board, a multimeter, a magnifying glass, and lots of light. Oh, and a laptop of course. First thing to do then, get all the components ready. As long as the parts are all numbered on the board, we can create and specify all the resistors, capacitors, semiconductors and so on that we find on the board and group them all together at the side. We'll use this collection to pick parts out from as the circuit progresses. If a resistor's colour code is tricky to read, and for some resistors it can be easy to get brown, red and orange mixed up, the multimeter can give you an idea of what it should be, depending on what other components of course are connected as they may or may not be influencing the reading. If the components aren't labelled on the board, or some components aren't labelled on the board, you may just have to make the numbering up as you go along. A little bit trickier, but not impossible, you'll probably end up just copying and pasting existing components as you go along. As long as you end up with the same number of each type of component on the schematic as you have on the board, hopefully you'll be fine. For integrated circuits, I tend to use the DIL sockets from the library and just label their pins to match those in the data sheets. Unless I can't do that, for example some mystery chip, in which case as the circuit is built I'll label them what they actually seem to be doing. Some ICs are already in the library, so I'll just use those unless I don't like the design, in which case it's back to the DIL sockets again. In this instance there's only one chip and it's an op amp, so I've used Eagle's built-in symbol for it. Once you've got pretty much all the parts ready, it's time to pick a component and work from there. This could be an IC, on the other hand on a power supply circuit it could be the rectifiers, where I'll place or build a bridge rectifier and work back towards the input and then forward at least as far as the reservoir capacitor. We know it's come back to it later on, once we've got something else that joins up to it. For this board, I'm going to start with those three phase power connections as they go through the relay contacts and the fuse. On some switches or relays, you may have to take care, as you'll need to use the multimeter again to determine which pins are the outer contacts and which is common. For push buttons, you'll often find that either side of the button has two pins, and you may even find that the joined together pins double up as jumpers for the circuit, for example in a daisy chain of switches on a front panel. On this diagram, you can see the relays are paired up in opposing orientations. Something's easy to see on this board, as they've also got blade terminals on the top. Next, I've added the thermal fuses that are glued to each capacitor, together with the two plugs that I missed from the initial list, as they're at the end of the wire, not on the board I was looking at. No component numbers for these, as they're not on the board itself, so I've made them up. I've also added the three LEM current sensors and the three current transformers, together with their six missing resistors. 
Now we get an idea of what those missing resistors would be for. They're probably burden resistors for the CTs, and they're missing either because the CT model fitted has them built in, or because the circuit's got some elsewhere. I've moved the fuses and everything to the left further over now to make room for a load of resistors that are tapping off the three phases. Often it's easy to work out what's connected to what, especially on a single-sided board with through-hole components, but if the tracks are obscured by components then that's where the multimeter comes in handy once more, as you can use the continuity test function to find both ends of a track and join those components on the schematic. It doesn't matter if the schematic's a bit of a mess at this point, you know it's tidied up later. At this point I suspected that all those resistors are going to get pulled down at some point, so I've repositioned them to feed downwards instead of up, the power lines feeding through are now going to be at the top of the schematic. I've traced more of the resistors now, this has turned out to be relatively easy for such a big board, as most of the circuit is triplicated. I've also traced the caps for the LEM modules, which are Hall Effect current transducers, which work like current transformers but can also measure DC current. I've also linked all the relay coils together, which interestingly don't just have a diode across them, they have a diode back to back with the 39 volt Zener, so it's not taking out the entire spike from the relay coils, only what's above about 40 volts. This looks like a big jump forward, but the main addition is the 40 pin socket, which several things connect to directly. I've also cut the zero ohm links on this board, as they were causing confusion when performing continuity tests, with five separate circuits all shorted together. I've also made a start with the diodes, which look like bridge rectifiers in their clusters of four on the board, but are actually connected in a ring. Some more missing resistors now, plus the zeners are put in an appearance, back to back to clamp the output of each set of three series resistors to 10 volts AC. I've also started putting together the op amps. One is spare, so I've put it over by the connector and used it to label where the chip's power rails are coming from. Next step, and all components are accounted for. If they're not on the main schematic, they're in the op amps just above, so let's bring one down and plumb it in. Now it looks pretty clear that the remaining four caps and two diodes over on the left are going to go to the other op amps. Nothing else is showing up at the moment as connected to the missing diodes either, so it's time for a bit of rearrangement. I've just roughly shoved the components over to the right, and the angle is deliberate. I don't want the tracks landing on an auto connecting to other components, so this makes sure they don't quite touch. The diodes for the first op amp now make a little bit more sense orientation wise, if not function wise, and it makes the circuit a little bit narrower, which makes room for the other two. Like that. Everything's looking a bit cramped up at the relays though, as I've squeezed more tracks in off the resistors to the connector, so let's drag things down and straighten those tracks. I'll bring that info box down as well. Normally I find some recess in the schematic where it'll fit without sticking out too much. In this case there's a big gap within the circuit, so I'll just shove it in there. Here's a worthwhile step. Labelling the connector pins. If there was a microcontroller or a CPU here, I'd label its pins as well. In this case, you can see that anything to do with the three phases is numbered from the bottom, one, two, three. And it highlighted an error in that it got the LEM outputs in reverse order. Fixing that now gives us three connections that cross over over on the right of the board. But if I swap the LEMs around, I can solve that. If I swap around those rows of resistors dropping down by the fuses, I can remove a load of crossings there as well, which will make the circuit easier to read. That's better. As you build up your circuit, you may start to get an idea of how it's working, and this comes in handy once you get to the point where you think it's finished. If there's a part of the circuit that really looks as though it either does nothing or just won't work, check its connections, you may have found you've missed a connection. I had that on my recent Antex 690 SD video, where a confusing group of op amps were rendered even more confusing by me missing out some key tracks that linked them together. I didn't realise this was the case until after I'd uploaded the video. It's also worth checking back on the IC data sheets if available, as they often have reference circuits that will either show that yes, this is how the circuit works, or lead you back to spotting tracks that you've missed out. And we seem to have that here as well. Look at the inputs of those op amps. What's the point of that design? You have two caps off what's basically neutral, one of which is a 100k resistor in series. Something must be missing. The multimeter found it. Probing from R1 found continuity to C1 at one end, but also to somewhere else. Cathode end of DZ1. Those zeners are clamping to 10 volts and they're not doing it for nothing. The op amps aren't just monitoring fractions of a volt on the neutral bus, they're sampling the supply phases. That's those joined up. The only thing left unaccounted for now is pins 2 and 31 on the connector, and it turns out they're just joined to each other. They don't go to any missing diodes, they don't go to the relay diodes, and they're not supply voltage pins, they just don't seem to go anywhere else. Perhaps they're just there to detect that the board's plugged in. One more tweak to component positions up by the fuse, and group some of the tracks together, and we're done. 
If you can, you can take a nice high-res photo of the board. You can then open this on your computer, zoom in, and do a final check of component values in case you've copied and pasted a component and forgotten to update the value of the new one. That's very easily done. And that leads me into why I recommend doing this. As you've drawn out the schematic, it should have given you at least some understanding of how it works. Again, on the Antex schematic, I wouldn't have had a clue how to design a circuit from scratch that drives four 14-segment displays using a two-wire serial bus, but by tracing out the board, it's giving me ideas on how to do it, even if I never end up needing to. For a faulty board, you also get a better idea of what could be wrong. For the Antex, it showed what was most likely to be blown by a short circuit in the output socket. It gave me two components to check first, and as it turned out, the first of those two components I checked was the faulty one. Going back to that massive Lasermax schematic, which surprises myself when I go back and watch that video, it showed me what obviously couldn't be wrong based on what the board was still doing, with the fact it was able to run its program code ruling out a big chunk of the circuitry as being faulty. So there you go. That's how I build up circuit schematics and usually glean a little bit of information about how it works as I do so. If you're interested in learning how circuits work, I highly recommend it. And by putting the schematics out into the public domain, you may help someone else who's got the same product and they're actually trying to fix it. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching.